please be advised, this episode does have content that some may find distressing. As always, listener discretion is advised and it is not suitable for anyone under the age of 13. Welcome to episode 55 of It's Murder Up North. Today's case was a fan suggestion, however, I wish to apologise because I cannot find the name of the person who suggested it. So if you ask me to cover this story, please contact me and I will give you a shout out on a future episode. I am always very happy to receive case suggestions or accept listener stories. So feel free to contact me at itsmurderupnorth at outlook.com or send me a message via the It's Murder Up North Facebook group or contact me on Twitter at Murder Up North. Before I introduce my podcast of the week, I want to give a special thank you to those who have left five-star reviews on iTunes. Thank you to Susie1H. I am honoured that you consider the show as one of your top five true crime podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you, Gem Angelique. I am so glad the show makes your Sunday. I will keep trying to bring you little known cases. Next to my podcast of the week, the Red Run podcast hosted by Grace, who is a wonderful host and person, and she has such a compassionate manner. Her show is well researched and is well worth a listen. Here is a sneak peek. Clarissa frantically called 911 and told the operator that she was 36 weeks pregnant and had just given birth at home, but the baby wasn't breathing and had turned blue. Paramedics quickly arrived and took Clarissa and baby Zander to the hospital, where he was rushed to intensive care. Hospital staff noticed that Clarissa's arms, hands and face were covered in blood, assumedly from the home delivery. But when they managed to check Clarissa over, they made the chilling discovery that she showed no signs at all of having given birth. Red Rum is a podcast focusing on the true victims of crime. Search Red Rum True Crime wherever you get your podcasts. Now, let's head to the episode... It's common to hear people say they never expect something like this to occur in their area. And that is certainly true for the villages of Campbellsforth and Strensel, two small hamlets roughly 25 miles apart, separated by the medieval city of York. This part of Yorkshire is primarily rural, with little hamlets sitting between vast waves of open countryside. And due to this, crime is law and serious crimes are very rare occurrences. So when the residents of Campbellsforth and Strensel woke up on Sunday the 18th of July 2004, they had no idea that their peaceful rural idols would become the focus of a national manhunt. The hamlet of Strensel, with its population of just under 4,000 people, was a close-knit village seated to the north of York. Despite it becoming a popular place to live for commuters, it still retained a strong community feeling where you knew your neighbour, socialised together at the local pub, and attended church on a Sunday. One couple who had enjoyed this rural location for many years were James and John Britton. They were both born and raised in the port town of Hartlepool. During the Second World War, both served their country. James enlisted in the Royal Air Force and became a Spitfire pilot. John joined the Auxiliary Territorial Service. The couple married in 1943, and following the end of the war, they moved to York, where James became a surveyor for British Rail, and John took employment as a secretary in a school. Over the preceding decades, they would welcome two daughters, Anne and Catherine, and by 1976, they moved to the village of Strensel, acquiring a substantial four-bedroom property which sat on just under an acre of land, with views of open countryside to the rear and the nearest neighbour approximately 170 feet away. 
During the preceding years, the Britton family had established themselves as respected members of the community. They were frequent churchgoers, and James worked as a coordinator for the Neighbourhood Watch. He also enjoyed his hobby of beekeeping, and was fondly known as Mr Bee, the Bee Man. By 2004, Mr and Mrs Britton, having seen their daughters move out, get married and have children of their home, were devoted grandparents. But having been married for 58 years, they were now in their 80s and were both in poor health. James had lost his hearing and was reported to have been suffering from a disease akin to Parkinson's, while his wife had suffered a recent fall, causing her to break her leg, resulting in her having to walk with a frame. Due to the couple being in poor health and virtually housebound, neighbours would regularly check in on them to ensure they were well and see if they needed anything. This was the case of 5 to 9 on the morning of Sunday the 18th of July 2004, when a neighbour stopped by to find the couple safe and well. Yet just two hours later, the neighbour's wife would return to the Britons' home to encounter a very different scene. After getting no response to her knocking, the neighbour pushed open the front door, which entered into a spacious hallway, the floor of which was tiled in a traditional black, red and white geometric pattern, upon which the lifeless body of John Britton now lay. Just off the hallway to the right-hand side stood the bright living room, with its large bay window filling the room with sunlight, but those golden rays fell upon the form of James Britton, who, like his wife, had been brutally attacked. As this brutal scene was being reported, 25 miles away in the village of Candlesforth, North Yorkshire Police had begun an investigation into the deaths of two women found deceased in a flat on an unassuming street. At the time, Campbellsforth had a population of just 1,500 people, with many of the homes being constructed during the 60s and 70s to house workers for the nearby Drax power station. Just like Strensel, this was an area where crime was low and murder was unheard of. The two bodies found in the one-bedroom flat were quickly identified as Claire and Diane Sanderson, 27-year-old twin sisters. Police had been alerted to the scene by Diane's boyfriend Ian, who had become suspicious after visiting the flat the day before. During questioning, Ian explained how he had been waiting for Diane to meet him at the Cricketers' Arm pub in Selby, but when she didn't arrive, he rang her phone which was answered by a man whom he recognised as his friend and Claire's boyfriend, Mark. Ian asked Mark where Diane was and was advised that the girls had gone to be with their mother after their father had died suddenly of a heart attack. During the course of the conversation, Mark offered to come and have a couple of drinks with Ian while they waited for news from their significant others. Having shared a few drinks in Selby Town Centre, the men made the short ten-minute journey to the flat in Campbellsforth. But as Ian stepped through the front door, his senses were assaulted by a foul odour, which Mark explained was due to the drains being blocked. Mark invited his friend to take a seat, but Ian became alarmed, upon discovering that his trousers became sodden in a red liquid that seeped from the cushions. Mark told him to excuse the bloodstains on the sofa, stating that Claire had experienced, quote, women's problems. Things got stranger for Ian when he got up to go to the toilet, and was followed upstairs by Mark, who stood by the closed doorway to the bedroom. Feeling uncomfortable, Ian declined Mark's offer to stay the night, and decided to head home and wait to hear from Diane. By the following morning, when he hadn't heard from his 27-year-old girlfriend, Ian called round to the home she shared with her parents, and was stunned when the front door was answered by George Sanderson. Diane and Claire's father who, according to Mark, had died from a heart attack the day before. With heightened concern, Ian, accompanied by George, headed to the flat where Mark and Claire lived. No one answered when they rang the doorbell, yet the pair found the door was unlocked. A stagnant stench clung in the air, inducing feelings of nausea as they entered the compact flat. The living room and kitchen occupied the first floor, and nothing appeared out of place, save for the dark stain on the sofa cushion which Mark had claimed was because of Claire having a period. As they made their way up to the second floor, where the double bedroom and the bathroom were found, the unbearable smell grew stronger. At the top of the small enclosed landing, 
the door to the bathroom stood ajar straight in front of them. Yet the bedroom door, directly to their right, was closed, just as it had been the previous night, when Mark had stood in front of it. Pushing open the door, they were accosted by the overpowering odour of decay. At the foot of the bed lay the lifeless body of Diane, and not far from her lay a form concealed in black bin bags. George Sanderson later told the court about the moment he discovered his twin daughters, quote, I went over and grabbed hold of them. I knew at that moment that Claire was inside. I looked back to Diane, and I wanted to cuddle her. When police initially attended the scene, they viewed it as a domestic incident, and given his unusual behaviour the previous night, the fact he lied regarding where the sisters were, and that he was now absent, Mark became their prime suspect. The investigation gained traction quickly, and within 24 hours, police had already begun to suspect that the murders of the Britons and those of the Sanderson twins were linked. Although police were not certain whether or not the victims knew each other, the only thing that connected them was the perpetrator, Mark Hobson, whose fingerprint had been discovered in the Britons' home. On the Monday, police held their first press conference, during which Detective Superintendent Javid Ali divulged information regarding the preliminary examinations of the four victims. He advised that 27-year-old Diane Sanderson had numerous injuries on her body, and it was believed her cause of death was strangulation. With regards to her twin sister Claire, the officer stated that further investigation would be required to establish how she died, but they could confirm that she had suffered a quote, violent assault. He then turned his attention to the details of Mr and Mrs Britton, with James having died from stab wounds, and as with the twins, he had also suffered several other injuries to his body. His 82-year-old wife Joan had been the victim of what was described as a vicious assault including stab wounds. However, like Claire, the initial post-mortem had not yet determined a cause of death. Detective Superintendent Javed Ali proceeded to state, they were a frail and harmless couple who had lived there for many years. We have not established any previous association between the Britons and the Sandersons. As a result of our inquiries, we now have a confirmed sighting of Mark Hobson in the Wigington area of York at about two o'clock on Sunday morning. We have now established a possible sighting of a man whose description is similar to that of Mark Hobson in the Strensel area at quarter past nine that Sunday morning. This, together with other evidence recovered from both scenes, indicates that the two incidents may well be linked. Following this information, the press were told that Claire's boyfriend, Mark Hobson, was considered a person of interest in the case. They urged members of the public to be vigilant and to not approach Hobson if they saw a man matching his description, which was given as being a five-foot-tall male of slim build, with a shaven, balding head and a two-inch scar near his left eye. Deputy Chief Constable Roger Baker continued to explain that they were considering this a nationwide manhunt and they intended to apprehend the suspect as soon as possible, stating, Murders are very rare in North Yorkshire, so to have two double murders is unheard of. Clearly, we want to speak to him about four murders. The sense of fear was palpable, with people being more conscious of those around them. The close-knit natures of the villages shone through, as residents paid more attention to those that were considered to be vulnerable. The increased police presence provided some reassurance, but not knowing where the wanted man was clearly had the public on edge. Hundreds of police personnel flooded the area, searching the vast countryside, aided by helicopters and police dogs, while the forensic teams continued to work on the two crime scenes trying to secure as much evidence as possible. Meanwhile, investigators worked to establish a motive for the murders, revealing that nothing appeared to be missing, particularly from the Britons' home, which ruled out robbery. However, police did confirm that a number of weapons had been recovered from both properties. They were continuing to work on finding any connections between the victims, but they would quickly discover that the Sanderson twins and Mr and Mrs Britton had no known relationship. They also wanted to determine where Hobson may be hiding. 
One lead, they considered, had been reported in the Sun newspaper, in which it was alleged that on Saturday the 17th of July, Hobson apparently visited some friends at approximately 8pm, during which he attempted to sell them Diane's car. According to these friends, Mark had claimed he was emigrating to New Zealand with the Sanderson family, and he had to sell the car to fund the move. Maxine Firth told the son about the visit, quote, I've been shaking ever since. My young daughters and their friends were playing in the house, and he seemed really agitated. However, police would quickly discount this claim, partly due to the fact that he lied about going with the twins to New Zealand, particularly because, by that time, the sisters were deceased, and searches of the flat had uncovered Hobson's identification. They also found a book detailing outdoor survival tips, which led them to believe that he was travelling by foot. On the 21st of July, it was reported by the Northern Echo that armed police had conducted a dawn raid and were searching a property in Selby as part of their hunt for Mark Hobson. Kerry Hay told the Evening Standard about her shock at witnessing the raid, quote, The police were shouting, This is the police, come out with your hands behind your head. I saw the police with guns, it was a bit of a shock. You don't normally get this. When I found out he might be in there, we were just hoping he wouldn't come over here. This operation was later confirmed at a press conference, in which they stated that they were acting on a tip that the suspect had been seen at the residence. However, they concluded that they failed to find him at the property, but were following every lead. Detective Superintendent Javid Ali told the conference, quote, We have searched a number of locations where we thought he may have gone. CCTV tapes have been seized from petrol stations, town centres and other locations, and taxi drivers have been put on alert. Friends and associates of Hobson's have been visited, and it's possible he is staying in one place or moving around. We are doing everything we can to find Mark Hobson. We are gathering evidence and searching both murder scenes. But it remains of vital importance that Mark Hobson is found, and found quickly. He could be moving around by foot, by car, or even by bike. I want people to keep an open mind. We just don't know at this stage. The police were not alone in appealing to the public for help. During the previous days, members of both the Sanderson family and the Britton family gave impassioned pleas for information, and Mark's mother urged her son to hand himself in. The Evening Standard quoted Catherine Wilkinson, the daughter of John and James Britton, who faced the press holding a photograph of the beloved parents and grandparents, stating, This is how I want to remember them. No one can imagine the horror and distress that has been inflicted upon our family. The past few days have become a living hell as we try to come to terms with the shocking news that has left us devastated. The question that we keep asking is why? Why would someone want to attack a lovely elderly couple who could harm no one? Why would someone want to take their lives and the lives of two young women? Our family has been rocked by the horror of all this as I am sure has the family of Claire and Diane, at the senseless waste of human lives. You must know the damage that you have inflicted, not only on your victims but their relatives, who will have to live with this memory for the rest of their lives. Believing that Mark was hiding somewhere in the countryside of North Yorkshire, searchers continued to scour the vast expanse, and detectives were chasing down any reports of thefts and burglaries which may have been perpetrated by the suspect. They also issued a warning to any premises selling alcohol to be on high alert. As D.S. Javid Ali stated, Mark was known to like a drink. As the manhunt approached the end of its first week, these continued with determination and with no signs of losing sight of their target. It was believed that Hobson was still in the region and so police issued thousands of wanted posters featuring a photograph and a physical description of the 34-year-old man. Officers were sent out to York races where thousands of spectators flocked from around the country to enjoy the horse racing events, and this was an ideal place to raise awareness, while roadblocks continued to be in place around the county, stopping and searching hundreds of vehicles. In an attempt to encourage more people to come forward with information, 
a van fitted with loudspeakers with enlarged images of Hobson, was driven around the areas in which the crimes had occurred. Meanwhile, Mark Hobson's estranged wife, Kay, came forward for the first time to plead with him to come forward, quote, Mark, I urge you to turn yourself in. Many people love you dearly. They'll all be there to support you, but you must contact the police. On Sunday morning, the congregation of St Mary's the Virgin Church held a service of remembrance for Claire, Diane, James and Joan. Leading the service, Reverend Martin Harrison reflected on the horrific events that had occurred in their quiet villages. Quote, Police cars outside the home of Mr and Mrs Britton have acted as a terrible sign that a week ago this very day wickedness and evil visited our village possibly evil in the vilest and in its most cowardly form. Today we remember the past week. We pray for Mr and Mrs Britton, their family and friends, also remembering Claire and Diane Sanderson and their relatives as we ask for you to comfort them at this difficult time. Just five miles away from the church service, 81-year-old Derek North was working in his petrol station which shared a plot with a furniture store ideally situated for passing cars. It was located in a rural setting with farmland surrounding it. As Derek quietly worked away, he recalled, quote, It was roughly 2.30pm and this chap came into the shop. I recognised him straight away. With his earring, his hair, his nose and scar. He bought a box of matches, a bottle of water and some cigarette papers. He paid in change and just went. We watched him and by that time the laddie from the furniture place came in, and we decided between us that it was him, so he ran down to his place and rang the police. Mark Hobson had spent the week since the murders hiding in the countryside, sleeping under hedgerows and travelling by night. He had almost been caught the previous evening, when a farmer noticed a man matching Hobson's description in a country lane, but by the time the witness had reached a telephone, the wanted man could not be located. Police quickly responded to the call from the garage and they moved in to arrest Mark Hobson, who was sat in a field not far from where he had last been seen. As officers approached him, Hobson proceeded to cut himself six times with a knife that was later determined to be from the Britons' home. Finally, after a week on the run, police now had the man who had taken the lives of four people. Mark Hobson had an ordinary upbringing. He was born on the 2nd of September 1969 at Many Gates Maternity Hospital in the city of Wakefield. He spent his early years living in the Eastmore area of the city with his parents, Sandra and Peter, and his two sisters, Melanie and Leslie. His father Peter worked at Walton Colliery, making his way through the ranks to become overmanager. His strong work ethic would be something he would pass on to his children. According to reports by friends and family, Peter was a very likeable man who did not have an aggressive temperament and wasn't a drinker. From the research I've done, it seems that Mark's formative years were happy and uneventful, with a positive home environment. His friends who went to school with Hobson described him as a shy and polite child who seemed, quote, happy and stable. In the early 1980s, Mark would experience his first major upheaval in his young life when the colliery his father worked at was closed down, leading to the family relocating 26 miles away from Wakefield to the town of Selby, where Peter Hobson began working at the nearby colliery. During his time at high school, Mark was perceived by one teacher as, quote, very well behaved, so average and ordinary that he was almost anonymous. Outside of school, he had a group of friends, and they would spend time hanging around the streets of Selby, but they'd keep to themselves and weren't considered as troublemakers by those who lived in the area. Mark's father had a great influence on his teenage son's life and after leaving school he pursued a number of jobs, proving himself to be a hard-working yet quiet individual who simply put his head down and got on with his work. At the age of 21, Mark first demonstrated his violent streak when he attacked a woman after they had had sex. She claimed that he held her by the throat and proceeded to hit her. She described the look on his face during the attack as being, quote, like a madman. She explained that his personality changed from a loving and caring man to someone who terrified her. 
During my research, I was unable to find if he was charged for this offence. Just a year after this attack, Mark started a relationship with Kay Stopford, who had been described as his childhood sweetheart. By 1993, the couple were married and had welcomed a daughter. Mark also adopted Kay's two children from a previous relationship. He had established himself as a hard-working family man, a devoted dad, and seemed to be following in his father's footsteps by being a man who strove to provide for his family, taking employment at Drax Power Station. Kay described him as the perfect husband. But something changed in Mark, who in 1998 began working as a doorman at a nightclub in Selby. He started drinking and using drugs. Then suddenly, on New Year's Day 1999, he left his wife and three children. A moment Kay would describe on the documentary, Married to a Murderer, quote, There was no one else involved. He just didn't want to be married. He just didn't want married life anymore. It was bizarre. I couldn't believe it. He turned to pot and drinking heavily. He never drank when we were married, but now he got out of his face. He became like a zombie. All they've done is rot his brain. His life just went completely off the rails. In 2002, while in Selby Town Centre, Mark encountered his friend William Brace, who was out shopping and was in a relationship with one of Mark's ex-girlfriends. Without explanation or provocation, Mark approached William on the busy street and proceeded to stab him in the chest five times, causing serious injuries including a punctured lung. Because Hobson admitted to causing grievous bodily harm, he was treated with leniency, and in 2003, just a year before the murders, he was ordered to complete a 100 hours of community service, and he would be held on probation for two years. Hobson was responsible for a number of other incidents that were revealed at the trial for the quadruple murders. He had been accused of punching a woman five times after he lost his temper, and two other women also claimed he had assaulted them. He was also involved in an attack during which he held a knife to a man's eye. Yet despite his displays of violence, Mark Hobson never spent any time behind bars. Speaking with the News of the World, Kay recalled what her estranged husband was like following the assault on William Brace. Quote, It was after the attack that Mark changed for the worse. He knew he had these demons inside. I had to stop him from seeing the children. Around this time, Peter Hobson died from cancer, which had a devastating impact on his son, who became increasingly dependent on drink and drugs, apparently drinking as many as 20 cans of beer a day. In order to fuel his addiction, he had begun to steal from friends and family. Seeing her husband's descent into addiction was difficult for Kay to experience, and despite trying to rebuild their relationship, she had to make the difficult decision, after fighting for three years, to cut ties with him. Kay did recall seeing Mark's relationship with Claire Sanderson, stating that they, quote, should never have been together, and were a powder keg, ready to explode. Mark and Claire had met while working in a factory in Selby, and the couple's relationship was a tempestuous one, sometimes the picture of love, and others, an explosion of anger and violence. At the time of her death, the couple had been together for a year and a half, and in April 2004 they moved into the flat in Campbellsforth, with the financial assistance of Claire's parents. The volatile relationship between Claire and Mark was not confined to the privacy of the flat. Altercations would regularly occur in public, and violence was a common sight, with Claire often seen with bruises and cuts. Naturally, her parents, seeing that this was not a healthy relationship, urged her to leave, but Claire remained loyal to Mark. They were not the only ones who were concerned about the volatility of the relationship, recalling violent altercations between the couple, mainly fuelled by alcohol. Georgina Lecky, an acquaintance of the pair, stated, They loved to spend the day happily drinking lager in the pub. Mark could really drink. They were both great when they were sober, but it was a different story. When they had been drinking, they turned into monsters, and then they would really fight. There were also claims from other friends that Hobson had poured bleach on Claire. He would be witness pulling her hair, punching her, and as Maxine first stated, one time, our friend caught Mark about to hit Claire with a dumbbell. He ended up having to separate them. Another time, Mark pushed Claire down a flight of stairs. 
But sadly, despite all the physical assaults, which often resulted in police intervention, and had caused Claire's friends to plead with her to leave Hobson, she would repeatedly forgive him. One friend who had pleaded with Claire to leave Hobson was Kelly Williams, whose attempts to intervene resulted in her friendship with Claire becoming estranged. Kelly said, I was worried something bad would happen. I was one of many friends who tried everything to persuade Claire to give him up. But it was no good. She loved him, and when he was sober, he loved her. Claire would often arrive at friends' houses, upset and showing clear signs of the latest beating she had endured. But as one friend recalled, she would say she was never going back to him, but always did. I think she thought that he would change one day. She had even been in counselling with him to help curb his drinking. Mark's terrifying changes in mood resulted in him being barred from a number of clubs and pubs, where his addiction to alcohol would always end in him being involved in fights. Many recorded that Mark had a Jekyll and Hyde character. Ian Lazenby told the Daily Mail, He was a strange type of person. He would be laughing and joking one moment, then totally different the next. He threatened to kill my son, to stab him. I can't even remember what it was about. He liked to portray himself as a local hard man, but he was the kind of guy who would pick on easy targets. The kind of guy who would thump you for spilling his pint. It's easy to imagine him battering someone or kicking their heads in, but I didn't think he was a killer. Following his apprehension and treatment for self-inflicted injuries, Mark Hobson would stand trial for the quadruple murders in April 2005, and a month prior to the court proceedings, he entered four pleas of guilty. The trial by judge began in mid-April 2005, during which Mr Justice Gligson would be presented the evidence and details of the case. In the public gallery, the Sanderson and Britton families would sit through the entire hearing, having to endure the details of their loved one's final moments. Prosecution laid out the details of the events surrounding the murders, starting by describing the defendant's violent history, from the assault on his girlfriend in 1990, to the attack on William Brace on a busy street in Selby, for which he had pled guilty just a year prior to the murders. Hobson's addiction to drink and drugs was also highlighted, and it was stated that when he was under the influence, his temperament would change dramatically, making him more volatile. Numerous statements from friends and neighbours were presented to emphasise the toxic nature of Claire and Mark's relationship, with one neighbour stating that arguments were so frequent and loud that he had become accustomed to turning the volume up on his TV to drown out the sound. Prosecutor Paul Worsley told the court that Claire and Mark had been in a relationship for 18 months, and it was apparent that Claire was besotted with Mark. Mr Worsley stated that a couple of months prior to the murders, Mark's feelings for Claire had changed, and he had begun to consider his future plans. The prosecutor advised the judge, quote, It was all part of a carefully laid plan by the defendant to lure Diane into the house. Some months earlier he made a comment that he had picked the wrong sister, and told a fellow refuse collector that he was going to have Diane. That threat came true. During the prosecution's presentation, it was revealed that while in a relationship with Claire, phone records showed that in June and July of 2004, Mark Hobson had made approximately 68 calls to straight and gay chat lines. Even on the day he murdered her, the defendant had placed a call at 12.28am, during which he left a voicemail which stated, Hi, I'm Mark, I'm 34 years old and I'm solar powered. Other people say I'm bold. I like a laugh in life. I'm living on my own at the moment. I'm contracted for six months and I've got a two-bedroomed house. I'm single in life, but no, I just want to meet somebody, to have a laugh and a giggle with. This message received five responses. The prosecution argued that this showed that the murder was premeditated, as later that day, Hobson would kill Claire. Mr Worsley advised the court that Claire Sanderson was last seen alive in the local pub where she was witnessed with Mark Hobson. The couple left the premises, with some reports stating that they were arguing. Once inside the flat, Worsley proceeded to state that Hobson had told the police he had attacked Claire in the living room with a hammer. This was verified by a forensic examination of the scene, which showed an attempt to clean the area with bleach, and it uncovered traces of blood on the sofa. 
While Claire was still bleeding, Hobson carried her upstairs to the bathroom, where he proceeded to wrap her body in black bin bags. Home Office pathologist Professor Christopher Milroy would later report that Claire had suffered a total of 17 blows to the head. Following the murder, Hobson concealed the body in the bedroom and proceeded to pretend like nothing was wrong, including having conversations with Claire's family, telling them that their daughter was okay. While his girlfriend's body lay in the bedroom, Hobson began planning the next step. He spent time reading an SAS survival guide, which a number of people at the local pub witnessed as he sat at the bar drinking. Seven days after Claire's murder, Mark enacted the next part of his plot by placing a phone call to Claire's twin sister, Diane. He told her that Claire had fallen ill with glandular fever and was asking for her sister. Diane left the home she shared with her parents in Selby and travelled the short ten-minute drive to the flat, expecting to find her sister ill in bed, but she had been lured into a trap by Hobson. Once the 27-year-old had entered the flat, Hobson sexually assaulted her, and in what Mr. Worsley described as a macabre and bizarre act, Hobson bit off Diane's left nipple, and it was theorised that he proceeded to eat it due to its absence from the crime scene. He then took her to the bedroom where he bound her ankles and wrists. He tightened a ligature about her neck with which he strangled Diane and following this he placed a bag over her head. It is theorised that he may have been planning to wrap up Diane's body in the same manner as he had her twin sister but he was disturbed from his task possibly by the phone call from Ian Harrison who called to check on Diane's whereabouts. Hobson answered this call and quickly came up with an explanation that the twin's father had died suddenly after suffering a heart attack. Prosecutor Worsley proceeded to explain that Hobson, who had been friends with Ian Harrison for 18 years, offered to join him for a drink, to which Ian agreed. After having a couple of drinks at the pub, Harrison and Hobson went back to the flat, where Ian Harrison recalled the distinct smell, which Hobson claimed was because of the drains. He also remembered sitting on the sofa and finding that his trousers were stained with blood, which Hobson alleged was because Claire was having women's problems. Ian Harrison declined Hobson's offer to stay in the flat that night. Returning home, he continued to be plagued by the feeling that something was wrong. Meanwhile, Hobson called his mum and asked her to drive him to the hospital in York, telling her that Diane and Claire had been hit by a car. While his mother waited in the car park, Mark went inside the hospital and a short time later he emerged and told her that he was going to stay and that the twins' parents would give him a ride home. At 2am, Hobson's mother left her son at the hospital, which is on Wigington Road in York, which is where an eyewitness claimed they saw him. He would later be seen to the north of the city in the area of Huntingdon, where he had broken into a house. Mr. Worsley continued to describe the events of the next morning, explaining how Ian Harrison called round to the Sanderson's home and was surprised when George Sanderson answered the door, alive and well. The prosecutor stated, quote, They drove straight to Hobson's home. The door was unlocked, so they went inside and noticed the smell of rotting flesh. When they went upstairs, they found the bodies of the twins in the bedroom. A statement written by George Sanderson was presented to the court, in which he described finding the twins' bodies. I went over and grabbed hold of them. I knew at that moment that Claire was inside. I looked back at Diane, and I wanted to cuddle her. I wanted to take the bag off her face. Something stopped me. At some point I touched Diane on the leg. I don't know what he had done to her. I thought he had raped her. He had taken away her dignity. She lay there with no claws and covered in bruises. Diane was lifeless. I knew she was dead. The prosecution advised the judge that Hobson had told police that he had killed the twins, yet with regards to Mr and Mrs Britton, he could not remember remember committing the crime, claiming that a cocktail of drugs and alcohol had caused him to lose a day and a half. Mr Worsley described how a neighbour had called in to visit Mr and Mrs Britton at 5 to 9 on Sunday the 18th of July and found them alive and well. However, an eyewitness placed Hobson close to the elderly couple's home at quarter past nine. It was speculated by the prosecution that Hobson had targeted the home 
possibly with the intention of stealing some clothing and food. However, there was no justification for the brutal murder that took place. It was argued that Hobson had first attacked Mr Britton, who was deaf and very frail. He may not have even heard Hobson as he struck the elderly man with his own walking stick, before stabbing James Britton in the chest and back. Mr Worsley then theorised that, quote, Mrs Britton, pushing her little walking frame, and with her poor eyesight, must have heard noises of the attack on her husband and gone towards it. Describing the brutal attack on the frail seven and a half stone John Britton and her husband, Mr Worsley quoted the couple's GP, who had stated, it would have taken someone to have hit them with a feather to have knocked them down. The defendant was to use something rather heavier than that, when he called unannounced at their home. John was attacked in the hallway of the couple's home, as she was allegedly bringing her husband a hot chocolate. Hobson had struck her about the head with James's walking stick, and she was also stabbed several times in the back. The attack was so frenzied that the knife handle had broken. After outlining the details of the murders, the prosecution presented the judge with key evidence recovered in the case. This included various quantities of drugs in the flat, a blood-stained hammer, and a list of items including bin bags, tie wraps, and a shopping list of items including bin bags, tie wraps, fly spray, and air freshener. DNA, fingerprints, and the fact Hobson was arrested while having a knife from the Britain's home in his possession connected him to the murder of the elderly couple and the twins. A particularly disturbing piece of evidence was presented to the court, which was believed to be a list of potential victims, including the twins' parents and his ex-wife Kay. Mr Worsley pointed out that the note may refer to a plan to kill George and Jackie in their own home, George in the garage and Jackie in the house. The note also included Diane's name, beside which Hobson had written, quote, Using abuse at will. Due to the fact that Hobson had pleaded guilty to four counts of murder, his defence team did not put forward their own argument, with Jeremy Richardson QC stating, This is a truly terrible case. The facts speak for themselves. The devastation caused to the family members is incalculable. I don't need to say any more in that regard. The defence lawyer concluded by requesting that when the judge considered the sentencing terms, he should take into account that Hobson had been cooperative throughout his interviews with the police and in the lead-up to his trial. He requested that the fact that the defendant had also acknowledged his guilt should also be viewed in his favour. The court then heard the victim impact statement written by George Sanderson in which he described the devastation caused by losing his daughters. Paul Worsley delivered the statement to the court, stating that Mr Sanderson had once been a man filled with joy and love in his life, but now he seeks solitude and is merely existing. After finding his daughter's bodies, Mr Sanderson had attempted suicide, and his wife had to undergo treatment for stress. In his statement, the twins' father wrote, Since the day I found Claire and Diane, I can't put it out of my mind. I found my girls robbed of their lives. They came into this world together and left it so tragically together. They were loving girls not only to each other but to anyone they thought needed love and a bit of encouragement. No one can ever know how empty we feel without them and we will never understand why this terrible thing had to happen to our two beautiful loving girls just about to start the best journey in their lives. Given the gravity of the crimes committed by Mark Hobson the judge, Mr Justice Grigson, ordered that the defendant undergo psychological tests prior to him passing sentence, declaring that sentencing would take place on the 27th of May, leaving the families to wait another month to find out if their loved ones would get justice. As they waited the sentencing hearing, police issued a statement from John's and James's daughter, Catherine, which was presented to the press by a police spokesman stating, My mum and dad will be missed by many people that they have come to know over the years. Anyone who came in contact with them will remember their kindness and helpful nature. They deserve to live out their lives in a peaceful and quiet way, and didn't deserve the horror that came their way that Sunday morning. 
the needless and horrific violence inflicted upon them, will be with me and my family for the rest of our lives. It is something that will never go away. The court reconvened on Friday the 27th of May 2005 at Leeds Crown Court, where the families of the deceased awaited anxiously to hear Judge Justice Grigson's verdict. Beginning by responding to the defence's argument that their client's sentence should reflect the fact he confessed to his guilt, and by doing so spared the family having to endure a long trial, the judge responded by claiming this was a preposterous defence, before proceeding to deny the defence's calls for a minimum term of 30 years. The judge did consider the psychological exams which had been conducted in the month prior to sentencing the results of which were presented by the defence lawyer Jeremy Richardson QC. He advised that the psychiatrists had taken into account that the defendant had a history of depression and that he demonstrated signs of an antisocial personality disorder. However, they had concluded that there was no clear psychological issues that could have led to the crimes being committed. The prosecution, led by Paul Wars the QC, argued that only a whole life order is appropriate because the seriousness of the offence is exceptionally high. Mark Hobson should never be released. Defendant had no alternative but to admit to the killings because the evidence against him was overwhelming. The judge proceeded to address the court, summing up the relationship between Mark and Claire as extremely abusive. Judge Grigson continued, quote, and when you tired of her, you transferred your attention to her sister, Diane. As Claire stood in your way, you murdered her. In my opinion, that was a premeditated act. You also determined to lure Diane to your home and kill her there, and then to use her for your own sexual gratification before killing her. And on the 10th of July, you did just that. You battered Claire with a hammer, in as brutal and callous a way as it's possible to imagine, before placing a plastic bag over her head, and having killed her, you wrapped her body in a bin bag. On the 17th of July, you succeeded in luring Diane to your home. It is plain at your hands she suffered not only terror and pain, but sexual harm before she died. The enormity of what you have done is beyond words. The hearing was temporarily halted, when in a burst of pure emotion Jacqueline Sanderson, the mother of Diane and Claire, was no longer able to contain her grief and hatred. Seeing the man who had taken her children stood in the dock, she shouted, Rot in hell, you bastard! Rot in there! The judge continued the sentencing by stating that You not only destroyed the lives of your victims, but you devastated the lives of those who loved them. The damage you've done is incalculable. The enormity of what you've done is beyond words. The hearing concluded with Judge Justice Grigson ordering that the only sentence that can be considered for such an atrocious crime is one of life without the possibility of parole. Following the verdict, the lead detective on the case, D.S. Javidali, addressed the press who had gathered outside the court. He told them, No one who has heard the details of this horrific crime can be surprised at the severity of today's sentence. I believe it is totally right and fitting that Mark Hobson is never released from prison. For me, today brings about the conclusion to the most horrendous case I have had to deal with in my 22 years police service. But for the families and loved ones, the victims of Left Behind, today does not bring about closure. My thoughts are with them, and I can only hope they gain some comfort from this sentencing. Thank you for joining me for episode 55 of It's Murder Up North. Episode 56 will be available next week. So in the meantime, keep an eye on those shadows. 